Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We call upon the name of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross for each and every one of us to be in this place tonight. Believers in you, God, uplifted and encouraged by your spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we know you'll do your part. God, we do our part tonight. We break out the big measure, measure of faith, God, that you gave us, the measure of heart, God, and interest and attention, God. We'll, we'll be diligent, Lord, to take note of the things that you have said, God, and to apply them diligently to our lives. Father, also, we don't just pray this blessing of your presence and your spirit upon ourselves. Also, we would pray it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field building your kingdom. So bless those churches that are out there that are preaching your gospel truth tonight. We bless them in the name of Jesus. Also, Lord, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Lord, we lift them up. We pray for them, God. We pray that you would bless them, cover them, protect them, God. Deliver them from the hand of their enemies and from the schemes that have been plotted against them, Lord. And God will give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. And we say... Amen. Have a seat. Tonight we're continuing our study called Upwards. Upwards. You remember we've been talking about Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 and verse number 23. Let me refresh your thinking on this. In Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 and verse number 23, we find a lot of these words that are listed here. And I would suggest to you tonight that these are upwards. These are things that will take you up. If you want to go higher in life, you need to get a hold of the power of these words. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, if you remember in the context of what he's talking about, he's talking about the works of the flesh versus the, the fruit of the Spirit. And if we operate in the flesh, there are some downwards that will come out of our lives. You remember, he lists some of those words that will drag us down. Adultery, fornication, wrath, envy, murders, drunkenness, all those sorts of things. And he says there's more than just that, but I don't even have to list them for you because they're evident. They're, they're, they're really easy to see. That's, that's of the flesh right there. I can see the way that that's dragging them down, that it is a downward, that is a work of the flesh. But as we walk in the Spirit, all of a sudden we find ourselves to be lifted up. That these are upwards, things that carry us up into the presence of God himself as we allow the Spirit of God to move in our lives. Now, you remember we talked about the first upward that we find is love. And love is the greatest power in the entire universe. And I believe that out of love come all of the other upwards because God is love. And therefore, if the Spirit of God is on the inside of us, then his love has been shed abroad in our hearts. And now all of a sudden, these other words can come out of our lives. So far, we've talked about love and joy. And tonight, I want to talk to you about the upward peace. Peace is an upward. People are constantly seeking peace. And you will never find peace outside of God. Amen. Let me say that again. You will never find peace outside of God. Just tonight on the, the way here, I uh, had dinner with my family. And afterwards, I, I left a little bit early because I was going to go and visit somebody in the hospital. One of our members is there in the hospital. And uh, he had something uh, strange happen to him. All of a sudden, he, he just uh, couldn't think straight. And, and he had words. And he knew what he was wanting to say, but he just couldn't form the words. Come to find out, he had a stroke. And so, uh, miraculously, he was able to communicate with his family, and they were able to get him to the hospital, and thank God that they did when they did, because they were able to do some things and, and have some countermeasures, and he is just fine. I mean, when I walked into the, the, the office there, when I walked into his hospital room, here was the doctor having a conversation with him, and it was just like, is this going on? Is that going on? Is this going on? He's doing tests, all this kind of stuff. And, and I just kind of came in. They invited me in and welcomed me in. The doctor didn't mind me being there, and so, uh, you know, my, my, my friend there sat me on the bed next to him and so the doctor's doing all these tests and they can't find anything wrong with the guy this guy is completely and totally healthy he's wonderful and they're they're going through all this list of questions no 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 nothing 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 you know all that kind of stuff and the doctor's going well we're just going to keep looking and we're going to keep testing and we're going to keep figuring this thing out and and if it's there we'll find it i believe that the spirit of god has healed him and he is totally healthy and well 
Now, the amazing thing to me about that was watching this man who had something severe happen to him. I mean, this is not an ordinary thing. Is that he was just sitting there with a little smile on his face, just like I've known him in church, just like I've known him for years. And he was just there praising God and just had this little kind of calm attitude about him. See, he had peace that passes the natural understanding. You know, I've seen people in hospitals that have been freaking out. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you were that person, right? But, but there are people who, when something happens, their world falls apart. In, in contrast, as I was walking out of that hospital room after praying with my friend and, and just visiting with him and his family for a couple of moments, as I was walking out, I, I passed by a woman who was sitting in one of the little waiting areas, and she had her phone out, and she was texting. And as I passed by her, I noticed her, and she looked sad. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody in the hospital looks sad, right? So nothing out of the ordinary here. And I get to the elevator and I push the button. And for some reason, I'm just drawn to this lady over there. My thoughts are going towards her. And I'm thinking, okay, well, Lord, do you want me to go talk to her? Do you want me to tell her Jesus loves her? Do you want me to wit? What? I mean, what's going on here? Lord, do you want me to pray for her? And the door to the elevator opens up and I step inside the elevator and I let the door close behind me. I push the button that says number one and I start going down and I just can't get it off of me. And so uh, by the time I got to the bottom, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go back and I'm going to pray for this lady if she's still there because I've had that happen to me before. And when the moment passed, it was like that, the person was gone. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm wise enough. I've I've been through this scenario before, but God, I'm going and and I'm going to go and pray for this lady. And so I get back up to the third floor. I, I step out, I come back over and there she is still texting on her phone. And so I walk up and I said, excuse me, I know this is kind of weird, but I just feel really like, I, you know, uh, maybe I should come talk to you and tell you that Jesus loves you and, and, and it, would it be okay if I prayed for you? Tears start streaming down her face. She says, it certainly won't hurt. Anything can help right now. Starts to tell me a story about her mom who had woke up this morning a little bit groggy and, uh, you know, just had some health complications and, and, and then went in for a routine surgery on her carotid artery in her neck. They were able to repair what was going on in her neck, but the doctor came out and told this woman that he had never seen such terrible damage to an artery in his entire career doing this routine surgery. There wasn't much hope, and she herself lived uh, quite a distance away, and she was supposed to be here helping her mom out for a couple of days, but her back had been hurt in a car accident, and therefore she couldn't help her mom and pick her mom up. Now, to make matters worse her, worse, her brother, who she said was a 40-year-old with the mind of a 12-year-old who was irresponsible and just didn't have a grasp on reality, she said that he was no help in this situation. And so I grabbed her hands and I said, let's pray together. I believe that God is a God who loves you. I believe that Jesus is, is here with us and that he alone has the power to heal and, and to take care of these issues in your body and to take care of these issues in your mom's body, even to, to get your brother on the right track where he can come in line and he can take responsibility and help out. And I prayed the prayer of faith right there in that hospital waiting area. Afterwards, she says, I'm going to try and keep an open mind. And I'm thinking, what on earth does that mean? And I said, well, do you know Jesus? I mean, he loves you, and, and, and I'm here to just tell you that right now. And she says, well, I, I understand that, but I, I'm really a Celtic, and I, and I believe in that, that sort of uh, you know, old Irish Druid stuff, and that God's in everything, and the rocks, and the trees, and the, the streams, and the rivers, and that somehow it all comes back together. And I believe that all religions are one. Can I tell you something? She had no peace with her belief system. But when you've got Jesus... You've got all the peace that you need. There's a difference. Because with Jesus, it's not a system. Jesus is a person, and Jesus is peace. Jesus is our peace. He is the prince of peace. He is the one who alone can bring peace. Think about it. Jesus is the one that spoke peace to the storm, and it calmed it. And he's the one who can speak inside your heart tonight, and he can calm the storms within you. People are constantly seeking peace. See, peace is a product of the Holy Spirit's work of love in us. Remember I said, out of love will flow all of the gifts. Because God loves us, we can have peace. And when we operate in the love of God, the peace of God will come upon us. See, the very thing that Jesus said to his disciples when he first showed up after the resurrection was, peace be with you. You remember that? Luke records it in his gospel. 
And John records it in his gospel. Both of them, they, you see an appearance of Jesus once on the road to Emmaus and once with Mary at the garden. But then when the disciples are assembled together and Jesus shows up for the first time, Jesus speaks peace. Because when Jesus comes, peace comes with him. Think about it this way. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. We always quote this verse at Christmas time, right? For unto us a child is born. Everybody say unto us. Unto us a son is given. Everybody say unto us. See, Jesus is for us, right? Jesus was given for each and every one of us. Now look at, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, Jesus was given to each and every one of us individually. Unto us is given the Prince of Peace. When Jesus comes into your life, the peace of God comes into your life. That's why the angels said at his birth, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. How could they say on earth peace? Why? Because Jesus had come to the earth. Therefore, the Prince of Peace was now on the earth. See, Jesus is our peace. Jesus is God extending terms of peace to humanity who is at war with himself and he's extending those terms in and through himself. You will not find peace outside of God. You will not find peace outside of Jesus. And you will not find peace with God except in Jesus himself. He is the way of peace. Let me show this to you in your Bible in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, okay? You're there in Galatians right at the end, right? Verse chapter 5. Turn just a page over to Ephesians chapter number 2. In Ephesians chapter number 2, it's talking about our salvation. Talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Talking about those who were inside the covenant promises of God and talking about those who were outside of the covenant promises of God. And in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse number 13, it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. So the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has brought those who were far off now near to God. Now look at the next verse, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now there he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, if you look at the context. Okay? He's made both one. He's made both Jew and he's made Gentile one. But the focus of tonight is that he himself is our peace. Look at that first part of that verse. He himself is our peace. In other words, there would be no peace without Jesus. Verse number 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That word enmity is another word you could, uh, you could use for war. Having abolished in himself, in his flesh, the war that was between us and God, right? That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. In other words, the Jews are now, if they believe in Jesus, they are now in Christ Jesus. And the Gentiles now, as they believe in Jesus, now they are one in Christ. We are now the body of Christ. So now there's not separation between Jew and Gentile those that had the promises of God and those that were outside of the promises of God. You know, the Jews, at the time of Jesus, you can even see it, they they had sort of a prejudice against all other religions, all other races, all other peoples, all other tribes. Why? Because they were the ones who had the covenants. They were the ones who had the promises. And therefore, they looked down their nose at everybody else. There was an attitude of arrogance about them. But now he's saying that that separation, that war between those two is gone, but as well, even more importantly, the war that was between us and God. See, we were opposed to God. We were living according to the flesh. We were going downwards. We were headed for hell. Why? Because the wrath of God was being stored up as punishment for our sin. But when Jesus went to the cross, he took that punishment on our behalf that whoever believes in him now, that whoever receives him and receives the adoption as a son or daughter of the Most High God now, now we become one in Christ and we have peace with God through him. Let's read on. Verse number 16, and that he might reconcile. Reconcile is, uh, you you may think of that as an accounting term, right? To reconcile the books, to, to level up, right? That he may reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He stopped the war, guys. Verse number 17, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were Near. In other words, it didn't matter if you're Jew or you're Gentile. Jesus came preaching peace to all. 
This, this invitation is extended to everybody. You're not going to find peace out there in the world. All you will find is trouble and trials and problems and pressures and wars and rumors of wars. And there will be uncertainty and there will be things shaken out there. See, but when you find Jesus, you find stability. You find the comfort you were looking for. You find the rest for your soul. You find the peace that you need. Look at the last verse, verse number 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Right there, you have the Trinity all in one verse. Through him, Jesus, you have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, to the Father. That means that when you operate in the Spirit of God, you can go into the presence of the Father who loves you. Loves you so much he didn't withhold his son, Jesus. Jesus is the way to God. And therefore, you can have the peace of God anytime, any place, any circumstance, you can be at peace. See, peace with God means peace in the world. Let me say that again. Peace with God means peace in the world. Now, I want you to notice something, okay? Notice I did not say peace with God means peace with the world. Everybody catch what I just said? Because we do not have peace with the world. The world is our enemy. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, wait a second, Pastor Dan. John chapter 3, verse number 16, for God so loved the world. Yes, the world meaning all the people in the world. And Jesus died for each and every one of those people. But the world's systems that are governed by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the one who has blinded the eyes of those who are still in darkness, the one who sways the governments under his control, we are at war with that enemy. I am at war with the flesh and the world's systems that would try and stimulate that flesh. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. It's on every billboard. It's in every magazine. It's on your cell phone now. It's at the gas station. They got a little television screen at the gas station talking to you now when you're pumping your gas. You can't get away from it. That spirit is everywhere. And there is a foul spirit that is coming against you that we are at war with. It is enmity with God. It is something that is opposed to God. Because the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, do not love the world nor the things of this world. See, we are not to be friends with the world systems with the devil he is not your friend he does not play nice he's a dirty little liar and you got to kick his butt out of your life but when the enmity with God is stopped and you have peace with God that means that you have peace in the world let me show this to you in your Bible great scripture to memorize John chapter 16 Verse number 33, turn there with me. Jesus is speaking, John chapter 16. Coming towards the end of his time on the earth. And in John chapter 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And really these words are contained for you and for me today to understand what Jesus wants us to have in our life. And that is peace. John chapter 16, verse number 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me, where? Oh, come on. Did you guys check out? Come on. That where? In me. Speaking of Jesus, in me you may have peace. Now notice what he says in the next sentence. In the world you will have tribulation. He did not say in the world you're going to have peace. No, he said in the world you're going to have tribulation. What is tribulation? It's trouble. It's trials. It's problems. It's pressures. That's part of life. You got a lot of Christians belly aching, bawling and squalling, wondering why the devil's beating them up, wondering why they're having so many problems in the world. I thought when I signed up with Jesus that all the problems would go away. It is time to grow up, quit being a baby, get your shields up, swords out, and start realizing there is a fight out there in the world. You will, you will, you will have tribulation. That is a promise of God you do not have to confess over your life to receive it every morning. It's just coming your way. Notice the parable of the sower. When the sun rises, it represented what? Persecution for the word's sake. Every day there's going to be something that comes against that word in your life. Every day there's going to be something that comes against your peace. Every day there's going to be heat and pressure and trials. And there's going to be a jerk boss. There's going to be a problem in your family. There's going to be somebody talking bad about you. There's going to be a bad news report. There's going to be tribulation in this world. Time for us to grow up and not be so shocked. Like, oh my gosh. Can't believe. Did you see what's on the news today? My God, guys, it's been going on forever. 
Since the world began in the fall of man, there has been trouble. The very first family, that one of their sons murdered the other son. And yet we're shocked. There have been problems. You know, you could read this Bible, and there's stuff in here that you would blush reading. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear what happened? I mean, there, you talk about rape, murder, uh, lies, intrigue, blackmail. I mean, it's all in here. One of Jesus' own sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Come on, you guys. And we expect it's going to be a bed of roses. No, every rose has a thorn bush underneath it. Hello. In the world, you will have tribulation. But look at what he says. But be of good cheer. In other words, I gave you my peace and you can be happy about it. Why? I have overcome the world. Woo! Think about it. Jesus didn't just talk about it. He lived this. Here they were. They all picked up stones. They were ready to kill Jesus. And what does he do? He walks right through the midst of them. They took him up to the top of a hill and they're ready to throw him over. That's some trouble, you guys. Nobody was trying to throw me off the top of the building today. I did stay home and study. But no one was trying to throw us off of a tall cliff. But what did Jesus do? He walked right through the middle of them. Why? Because he's God. And that same one who walked right through the middle of a trial, the same one who went right through the presence of his enemies, the same God that was Jesus in the flesh now is that spirit of Christ that lives on the inside of you. So you can now walk through every problem. You can go through every trial and any pain and pressure that comes against you. You are strong enough to take it. If you're walking in the spirit. But God wants us to have peace. Let me, let me just read you something real quick that I, that I put together. God wants us to have peace. I just took a little study about peace. You know, peace is all the way throughout the Bible, hundreds of times. In the New Testament, in the epistles, the epistles are the letters that have been written to the church. These are things for us. In fact, as Christians, I believe we ought to be living a lot of our lives, a lot of our time in the epistles. Even though I would say read your entire Bible, dive into the whole thing, we need to realize that this is where we live, and therefore we need to understand this and get a grasp on this the most for our lives, because this is the application of the rest of the book. Okay, everybody tracking? Romans chapter 1, verse 7, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he says grace. Grace is that, that sovereign divine ability of God to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. it the, the root word is the charisma. It's the, the charis, the grace, right, that comes to us. So it's a spiritual gift that is given to us. So when you walk in the spirit, the spiritual gift and ability of God is the peace of God that comes to our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He mixes it up a little bit in Galatians chapter 1, verse number 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. The second part says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 1 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do I sound like a broken record yet, somebody? First Timothy chapter one, verse number two, and then second Timothy chapter one, verse number two, and then Titus chapter one, verse four. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Why does he add mercy in there? Because these guys are pastors and they were dealing with church folk. Look at your neighbor and say he's talking about you. <laughs> Philemon chapter 1 verse number 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2, the second part says grace to you and peace be multiplied. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Second John chapter 1 verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Jude chapter 1 verse 2, mercy, peace. Peace and love be multiplied to you. In Revelation chapter 1, verse number 4, the second part says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. See, you cannot find peace outside of Jesus. Now, if that wasn't enough, 
58 of the 66 books of the Bible carry the word peace in them. Shalom in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word for peace, meaning safety, well-being, happiness, friendliness, also health, prosperity, favor, perfection in the sense of completion or wholeness and contentment. The root word for shalom is shalom, all right? And it talks about really that there's a completeness, there's a completion or an accounting, a settling of debts, that where there was something that was causing enmity or division, now it has been reconciled together and brought back together in order to bring satisfactory conclusion. That is the peace that happened when Jesus went to the cross and he satisfactorily satisfied the will of the Father and the, and the handwriting that was written against us and therefore bringing us peace. It is the shalom of God. Shalom is used 236 times in 208 verses in the Hebrew concordance of the old King James Version. Now in the New Testament, we find another word. It's called Irene, I think, okay? And that's really kind of the, the way it is, Irene. It carries much of the same meaning as shalom. And it's used 92 times in 86 verses in all of the New Testament books except for 1 John. Now, in 1 John, you will not find the word peace. So if you're looking for peace, you will not find peace in 1 John. You will find love, you will find grace, you'll find the Holy Spirit, but you will find no peace in 1 John. Now, when you add in all the other words in the Bible for peace, you will find the word used 392 times in 369 verses in the New King James Version. That means that you could read one verse on peace every day of the year. That means that God wants us to have peace every day of the year. Come on, he wants you to have peace on Monday. He wants you to have peace on Tuesday. He wants you to have peace on the second Wednesday. He wants you to have peace on Thursday in February. He wants you to have peace at Christmas. He wants you to have peace at Thanksgiving with your relatives. Oh my goodness, God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have peace. Say that out loud. God wants me to have peace. See, sometimes we don't think that. We think God's angry at us. That God wants us to be troubled so that we can learn a lesson. No, God wants you to have peace while you're learning the lesson. God wants you to have peace while you go through the trial. God wants you to have peace while you go through the problem. Listen, you don't find Jesus foaming at the mouth, spitting and trying to punch the air when he's fighting the devil. No, he just pulled out the sword of the spirit. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. He had the peace all the way through it because he is the prince of peace. We get the wrong idea about these things. Now, don't mistake that he had no passion. Jesus was very passionate. But even in his passion, he had peace. He wasn't worried about a thing. So how do I stay in that peace? If we boil it all down tonight, really this is where the rubber meets the road. If we want to stay in that peace, what do we got to do? You know, we already know that if we walk in the spirit, that we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we won't go downwards. But we also know that as we walk in the spirit, that the fruit of the spirit is peace. It is one of the nine fruits that we see mentioned in the Bible. So how do I stay in that peace? If I'm staying in the spirit and I've got the peace, how do I work with that? I'm glad you asked. A couple of things. First one is this, pursue it. Pursue peace. You'll find that all throughout the Bible. In fact, uh, we're gonna be talking about that more and more as we go throughout the book of Hebrews and in the, the weekend morning series, you're gonna hear more about that. You can pursue peace with other people. You can pursue peace on the job. You can pursue peace at home. You can pursue peace in your interests, in your endeavors. You can pursue peace in your your life's ministry and your work for the Lord. You can pursue peace in your alone times. You can seek and pursue peace at any time, in any place. Psalm chapter number 34, verse number 14 says this, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The Bible also tells us in the book of Proverbs that when a man's ways please the Lord, that he will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's pretty amazing, you guys. So what is he saying? He's saying if you will do God's will, God's way, then you can seek peace. Then you can have the peace of God in your life. But when you don't do God's will, God's way, don't expect the peace. You understand? See, when when we get outside of the will of God, when we get outside of the way of God, when we sin, when we transgress, when we go on our own route, when we do our own thing. You know, when I was in that elevator, I had no peace. I was there going down to the bottom level, getting ready to go to my car, but I knew that I was troubled on the inside because God had an assignment for me. But when I got back on track and when I pushed the number three and I started going up once again, all of a sudden, and when I started to sit down and started to minister to that woman there in the hospital waiting room, all of a sudden the peace of God was with me once again. Why? Because I was back in line with God's will and God's way. 
We get the wrong impression about evil. We think evil is just the bad stuff that, that makes us look bad. No, evil is anything contrary to the will and the way of God. Evil is whatever God calls evil. And woe to us if we call evil good and good evil. We're in a society right now that is redefining things. They're redefining marriage. They're redefining lifestyles. They're redefining money and finance. They're redefining uh, uh, just culture in general. They're, redefin- they're moving boundary lines. And they're drawing new lines. But let me tell you something. You cannot draw that on me. You cannot draw that on my God. You cannot draw that on this gospel. Because what God has said is set in stone. And you can draw as many lines as you want to. But God is the one whose counsel will stand. And whatever God calls good is good. And whatever God calls evil is evil. And as we stay in what is good according to God, we will have the peace of God on our lives. Every time. Every time. I was just asking... Pastor Jim this weekend about an experience he had where somebody came to him and they had been involved in some things, they got in trouble with the law and they were running and they knew it was wrong and they knew that if they turned themselves in, that they would go to jail. And pastor said, I had to tell him what was right. And I was a young pastor and decided just to tell him, hey, you need to do the right thing. You need to turn yourself in. And he said that he was you know, praying for the guy and they, they went after him and he didn't really see the guy after that and thought maybe he did the wrong thing. But then later on, come to find out, this man gave his heart to the Lord and became a missionary and this church supported him for a number of years. See, you can trust that God will take care of life, that God will do the right thing when you do the right thing. When you seek peace and you pursue it, when you depart from the evil and do that which is good in God's eyes. You gotta pursue peace. But not only that, you also got to pray for it. You got to pray for peace. There's a great section of scripture in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6 and verse number 7. Many of you guys probably could quote it, and I would encourage you guys to memorize these scriptures because as you go into the world and the trouble hits, it's good to have these things. When the pressure, when the squeeze comes on your life, the stuff that you put in is what's going to come out. And so if you put in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6 and verse number 7, when life starts to squeeze, that will be what comes out of your life. And so let me read it to you in the Living Bible, okay? I like the way it says it in the Living Bible. Now, this is a paraphrase, all right? But I I just really enjoy how it says it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I like that. Don't you like that? Isn't that good? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs. And don't forget to thank him for his answers. I mean, this is, is, this is talking to anybody other than just me. I'm preaching to myself right now, okay. Verse number seven, if you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? Don't worry about a thing. Pray about everything. Give it to God in prayer. As you do, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds by Christ Jesus. That's what the New King James Version says. See, we need to understand that when you don't have peace, when you have trouble in your spirit, maybe you're troubled in your mind, that as you start to give that to God, the peace of God will descend on you. My wife is very uh, you know, gifted in the sense that uh, she's got this perception, this, this sort of prophet's anointing on her life. She's very black and white. It just, it is or it ain't. There ain't no in between. All right, come on, somebody. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Dr. Fred Adams on the front row shaking his head yes because he's the same way. Now, my wife at times will just know things by the Spirit. She's got that kind of perceptive mentality. Or like, you know, we'll be walking somewhere and we'll meet somebody or we'll be talking to somebody and like her spidey sense is going off. I don't even know what it is, right? It's just kind of that, that prophet perceiver thing going off and she just feels bugged in her spirit about something. And oftentimes in ministry, she's been ready to just pull out the gun, shoot, and then ask questions later. And I'll back her down and be like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Easy, Starsky. Put the gun down. Why are we doing this? Now, listen, we can talk about her. She's not here tonight. She's home with the kids, getting them ready for school tomorrow. So let's talk about her. But um, (laughs) honey, if you're watching the live stream, I love you. Uh, So I'll say, what what are you doing? What are you basing this off? Why are you mad? Like, what's going on? You know, and she'd be like, I just, I just don't know what it is. I just sense in the spirit that something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. (laughs) I get it. But what are we going to do about it? We, We have no, like stuff, you know, no, no reason. We, if, if I confront, you know, and, and they say no, then I got to believe it. You know what I mean? Like we can't do that right now. 
And oftentimes I'll say, well, hey, have you prayed about this yet? No, I don't need to pray. I know. You know, it's like, okay, well, listen, back down. Maybe God is speaking to you. Maybe God is giving you this not to react, not to respond, but to lift it up in prayer. Many times where she has started to train her spirit over the years that I've been married to her, my goodness, she has just become this mighty woman of God. And now there's been times where she's just known something by the spirit. And she's given it to the Lord in prayer. And then afterwards, something came up, and I'll be like, whoa, why didn't you tell me about this? Did you know about this? She's like, yeah, I knew. I knew a month ago. And I'm like, why didn't you say anything? Because I prayed, and I was just going to let God deal with it. And I'm like, okay, you know, go, girl. All right. Hey, good on you. See, sometimes things happen in our lives that we don't understand. We don't know what God is doing. If you're walking in the Spirit, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Now, that doesn't only pertain to good things. Sometimes God will show you trouble. Like, how about the Apostle Paul headed towards Jerusalem, and in every city, the Spirit testifies that tribulations and persecutions await him. He's got Agabus, who prophesied a famine that came to pass. This guy, when he speaks, stuff happens, all right? This guy takes Paul's belt and wraps himself up and binds himself. The owner of this belt is going to be bound in Jerusalem. And, and, and yet, he had peace, and he was able to still go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he knew that it wasn't about himself. He knew, I'm not going to worry about a thing but I'm going to pray about everything. Give it to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Here's Paul on a ship that, that's in the middle of a storm. They're throwing all of their food, their supplies overboard, trying to lighten the load. They, they've wrapped things around the ship so that if they run aground, it won't break the ship apart. I mean, just the, there's no hope. And here stands Paul in the midst of them. He says, guys, you should have listened to me. And yet the angel of the God whom I serve has stood next to me this night and told me it's all going to be okay. You know why? Because he gave it to God in prayer and God sent his messenger, that angel, to speak peace and comfort to Paul. You know, God can speak a rhema word to your life. The rhema word is the spoken word. It's the word that comes alive. It's not the logos, which is the entirety of the word of God. It is that spoken, that now word. It's when you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden that verse just jumps off the page and slaps you right in the face and it's like, whoa! Whoa! My goodness, and all of a sudden you have the peace of God. You understand, okay, God, I see the picture now. I see what it is that you're doing. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. If I could leave you with anything tonight, it's this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. There is no peace outside of Jesus, and the more you gather the presence of God into your life, the more you draw near to him, the more you give him everything in prayer, and the more you allow him to lead you in every day of your life, the more peace you will experience. Let us walk in the spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh, and as we walk in that spirit, may the fruit of peace lift us up in every area of our lives. Can you guys give the Lord a great big praise for the peace of God tonight? God is good. Hey, I'm going to just take a couple more minutes of your time, then we'll let you go tonight. I'm going to ask everybody at this time, please remain seated. Please don't leave. just want to do one more thing with you guys before we head out of this place. Tonight, we've talked about Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Tonight, we've talked about the war, talked about that, that enmity that was between God. Maybe tonight that was a new concept for you. Maybe tonight you've understood that, but you haven't operated in it. See, it's not enough just to know about God. Do you know the demons know who Jesus is? They know about God. The devil himself can quote scriptures. You'll find that in your Bible and the Gospels. The devil's quoting scriptures to Jesus. And yet that doesn't qualify the demons and the devil for heaven. They're not headed for heaven because they know who God is or because they can quote some scripture, because they can understand what the scripture has to say. See, the demons understood the scriptures. The devil understood the scriptures. Yeah, he twisted them, but he understood them. And yet, that doesn't qualify them for heaven. So it's not about what you have up in your head, not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is. But rather, something else has to take place in your life for you to be a Christian headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell, for that war to be over in your personal life. Because the Bible says that those who are not children of God, the wrath of God still rests upon you at this time. That's a fearful thing, you guys. That means that if you died tonight, that you wouldn't make it to heaven, but rather that you would go to hell. Now, sometimes people think that when pastors start talking about hell, that they're being insincere, that they're being mean, and that they're just being hurtful. And yet, let me ask you something. If your child was out there playing in the street and you saw a truck coming at them, about ready to flatten them, would you be nice about telling them to get their little butts out of the street? 
Or would you yell at them? Would you tell them the truth? There's a truck coming, dummy. Get out of the street. See, I'm not being mean tonight by telling you about hell. Not being mean tonight. It's not a mean-spirited thing. I'm not trying to lord over you. But rather, it's out of love that I tell you this. There's something coming your way that if you don't get out of the way, you're going to end up in hell. And you're going to miss heaven. Sometimes people think, well, if I can just be good enough, I'll get to heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say, just be good and that'll get you into heaven? Our good works won't get us to heaven because our goodness compared to God's goodness like filthy rags. The standard to get into heaven based on your own good works is perfection. And there is none who is perfect except one. His name is Jesus. You're not going to make it to heaven based on your own merit. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have messed up. I have messed up. We cannot make it based on our own goodness. You can't be good enough. There's no grading scale, no line, no curve that you have to be above behind the maps. That this is the scale. Be this good and you'll get to heaven. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't matter if your good outweighs your bad. It doesn't matter if you've gotten involved in social justice causes. It doesn't matter if you've been nice to your neighbors and people think good thoughts about you at night. It doesn't matter because that's not going to get you into heaven. Sometimes people think if they can just attend enough church that if your parents raised you in church and tell you that you're a Christian growing up, that that makes you a Christian. People think that if they wear religious jewelry, a cross or St. Christopher around their neck, be baptized or christened as a child, go to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, maybe catechism class, that you can go to heaven. And yet, can I tell you something? No one in the Bible say your parents raised you in church. Tell you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, well, wait a second. It wasn't just when I was a child that I did all that stuff. But now as an adult, I'm sitting here in church right here in front of you. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, no. It's like me saying, you know what? I'm going to go down to Dodger Stadium in L.A. I want to play Dodger baseball. Bring my bat and my ball. Buy a uniform. Put it on. Wear it. Sit in the dugout and say, I'm a Dodger. I'm a Dodger. I'm a Dodger. And think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there. Drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a member of the Dodgers organization. You can't just sit in church service. Call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. You say, but you don't understand. My last church, I got involved. I helped out. I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible. Made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, no. Could you show me in the Bible your church volunteerism gets you into heaven? Can you show me in the Bible the passage that says God is waiting at the gates of heaven next to St. Peter looking for membership cards? Hey, Peter, don't let him in without a membership card. It doesn't work like that. Not going to get to heaven based on your church volunteerism, helping out. Sometimes people say, well, doesn't God let everyone into heaven? Don't all roads lead to heaven now? Jesus has gone to the cross. God is love. God loves us so much. He lets everybody into heaven. No, that's not what my Bible says. Because God loves us enough to give us a free will choice. And he doesn't want to be with people that don't want to be with him. Remember, you decide. You have the choice. You can have as much or as little of God as you want. And there are people out there that just don't want any of God. And that's your call. That's your choice. God will love you all the way to hell. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can be with God. Sometimes people think, well, you know, if it's not that, then what is it? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Because Jesus said it like this. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Remember, we said there's no other way to have peace with God except through Jesus Christ. Jesus took that punishment for our sins. You heard the gospel preached tonight. And yet it's not about just knowing. It's not about just doing good. It's not about your church attendance. Because Jesus made this statement to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't say attend enough church. He didn't say know enough scripture. He didn't say do enough good. Why? Because this guy Nicodemus had done all that and more. This guy by our standards was probably better than all of us. Gave his money. People looked at him to find out about God. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, whoa, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. Rather, what does Jesus say to Nicodemus? He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals, made it out to be some foolish goofiness that no one wants to be a part of. And yet Jesus said, unless you be born again, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. So what does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold 
because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now that's pretty gross, right? Pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. And occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to have you just bow your heads and close your eyes. Just to tune everything out and have a private moment with God. As you're there with your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you a question. Here's what the question is. I'm going to tell you in advance so that you know. I'm not trying to trick anyone tonight. Super simple, super easy stuff. What if you died tonight? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? As you answer that question in your heart, no one will know the answer but you and God. You don't have to say it out loud. But just answer that question in your heart. Now, you may answer that question, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Maybe I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven. I really don't know if I'd go to heaven. Or, mm, I know I wouldn't go. I know I wouldn't make it. If you answered any of those different ways, then that's an indicator that you need to get right with God tonight. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. So what I'll do is I'll ask that question after a moment after you answer it. I'll count to three just like this. One, two, three, and then I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, all you got to do is simply raise your hand if you want to give God all of your heart and if you want to give God all of your life. It's just this easy tonight. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Then afterwards, I'll bring you up right here and we'll pray together a simple prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. Be born again, okay? Remember, I'm not trying to trick you. This is just how it works. You got to invite Jesus in. He's a gentleman. He won't come in without your invitation. So I want to lead you in a prayer tonight to invite Jesus in your heart, to be your Lord and to be your Savior, to end that war in you tonight personally with God so that you can have the peace of God in every area of your life through Jesus Christ. Not gonna happen any other way. Not gonna have peace with God, not gonna head for heaven without Jesus in your heart. It happens when you're born again. Who should raise your hand tonight if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night, make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. A little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer, a little church attendance. Listen, get ready to get your hand up. You can make a right relationship with God. Front to back, left to right, back in the family rooms, I see you guys. You ready to get your hands up? If you're out there in the foyer, down at the cafe, come on. You can get your hand up right where you're at as well. God sees and God's watching. Online, wherever you're at, across the nation and around the world, you ready to get your hand up. God is wanting to come into your heart and life tonight. And it's this easy. God sees and God's watching. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. Everybody bow your heads. Everybody close your eyes at this time. Just take a private moment with God and consider where you're at with God right now. Consider in your heart, what if you died? tonight. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart right now. If you answer that question, I think, I hope, maybe, I don't know, I hope so, or I wouldn't go. Get ready to get your hand up. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one over there. I got you. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Raise it up high for me. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Tonight is your night of salvation. There's two wise people. Come on, I know there's a lot more than two. If you answer that question, I think so, I hope so, maybe I'd go, I don't know. Come on, come on. Don't leave this place not sure. Tonight is all you have. We are not guaranteed tomorrow, and you better make sure. If you know you wouldn't go, come on. Tonight is your night. There's two wise people in this place already. If that's you, just get your hand up high. Anybody else real quick tonight? Lift it up high for me. Anybody else? Raise it up high for me right now. Anybody else? I'm going to wrap this up and we're going to pray together. If you want to be included in that prayer, come on, get your hand up. There's two wise people already. Anybody else? Raise it up right now. If you feel the Spirit of God tugging at your heart, come on, don't resist them. There's three. Got you over there. Thank you. Who else tonight? It's going to take one more moment. If you're not sure tonight or you know you wouldn't make it, come on. Don't wait another moment if that's you. Anybody else? This is the last call, then I'm going to wrap it up. If that's you, 
where you at. Thank you, thank you. Number four, number five. God bless you. Number six over there, number seven. I got you guys up there. Number eight, got you over here. Number nine and number 10, if you're out there. Come on, get your hand up. This is your time right now. If that's you, just lift it up high and then I'm gonna wrap this up. We're gonna pray together. If you wanna be included in that prayer, come on. Come on, is there anybody else? All right, let's pray together. Let's all stand at this time. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front. Come on, I wanna pray with you tonight. So let's all welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on down to the front. Let's pray together. Come on, come on, come on. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty. They're coming, you can come too. Even if you didn't raise your hand, come on down right now if you wanna pray this prayer. Come on. Who was else if you need to come. Come on. From the family if you need to bring your children and they raise their hand. You can come to you right now. Come on down. Come on if you raise your hand or you should have. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Hey, thank God you guys have come. Now listen. I think there's some that didn't come that still raised their hand. But listen, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by giving God all of your heart and all of your life. I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, but you're still standing out there, hey, it's not too late. You can be included in this prayer right now online. If you're watching and you raise your hand, get ready to pray this prayer right where you're at as well. Now listen, I'm going to pray simple phrases to invite Jesus in your heart right now. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Okay, all you got to do is repeat these words out loud. Now, it's not about the words right now. This is about the expression of your heart going before the Lord, okay? You're going to be born again. I don't know what God does to make that happen, but Jesus is coming and making his home on the inside of you. You got a brand new start, and the peace of God comes with him tonight. All right, so let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes. Put your hearts on the Lord right now. And everybody say this together, especially those of you who need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Wash me with your blood and cleanse me of my past. I declare that today the war is over. That I have peace with God through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who I believe is the Son of God, that He came, that He died, and He was raised again to life just for me. Fill me now with Your Holy Spirit and let it be known that from this day on, I am saved. I'm a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise tonight. Now listen, you guys, we want to help you in your new walk with God, okay? So we want to give you some free stuff, all right? Just a quick little, little booklet that uh, we wrote here at the church that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord, find out what to do next in your walk with God, introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's just a, a person, one-on-one, -on -one, someone who will come alongside you and encourage you in the things of God so you don't go back to the old way, but you go on in God's way, walking in His Spirit, experiencing His peace, okay? We'll take a couple minutes of your time and then we'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. He wants to get that information to you, talk to you about that, and then let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys just follow Pastor Joel right this way, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.